Today we're lucky to have Sabrina with us um, and she will present a lecture about the importance of small brands. I mean, she'll tell you more in a minute. Uh, but yes, yeah, Sabrina, if you can, please share your screen and you know, we can start. Yeah, sure. Um, maybe let's also, let me welcome everyone and say hi to everyone um, from Kiev. Um, it's uh, already dark outside. I know it's late, but thank you very much also from my side for joining uh, the lecture today. Um, and first of all, I also would like to congratulate you to participate in the International Young Designers Contest because this already proves uh, that you're one of the most talented and creative uh, minds um, of your country. And I think this is something you can be really proud of. And I'm also very excited to talk to you today to share some experiences um, I made in the past couple of years in the fashion industry and to share some food for thoughts, maybe for future collection development or brand strategy. So um, yeah, let's talk about small brands with big impact. Um, so let me try to share my screen and also as soon as you have uh, questions, please always uh, interrupt uh, and, and ask um, so that we can clarify immediately. Also, I hope that you hear me well, that I'm not talking too fast, so please always jump in and, and uh, let me know, feel free. So today I would like to talk about how to create lasting reach and recognition as a designer brand, small designer brand in Western European uh, markets. And um, before I start, let me say two words about myself to introduce myself, because I heard that you uh, know each other already very well. So let me also say something about myself. Um, so I'm Sabrina, um, I'm, com I'm coming from Germany um, and I'm working for more than 13 years in the fashion industry, mainly also in Germany. And uh, I um, worked in several companies uh, in several positions, so starting from York, this is a small premium brand in Germany in product uh, management, Tom Taylor, more mass market, mainstream, uh, where I was leading the retail business, and Zalando, uh, Europe's biggest online platform where I was heading the buying department for women footwear and accessories um, almost five years long. And uh, there I was responsible for almost 300 brands and uh, almost 50 employees. Um, and this was pretty, pretty exciting. And so um, that's why I would summarize my core strength uh, and um, advantages, let's say, in people development, because I worked a lot with young people in the fashion industry, um, with brand um, strategy, because um, I was responsible for very small niche brands up to Nike in my um, portfolio, and of course, uh, e-commerce. And then end of 2018, I decided to leave Berlin and to move to Kiev because my husband is uh, living in uh, Kiev since 2016. He's working in the automotive industry. It's actually from Holland. And after traveling back and forth at a certain point, um, I decided to uh, permanently also move to, to Kiev. And during this time of back and forth, I was able to join the Ukraine Fashion Week many, many times. And I saw really the high potential um, of creative talents, young, um, very open-minded, very creative people here in Ukraine. And that's why I started uh, beginning of 2019, my company, Gilda House. And uh, this is not only um, very standard, my, my surname. Um, no, it's actually also a German word for um, a place like centuries ago um, where craftsmen, so creative people and salespeople, salesmen um, met um, we're connecting, we're discussing, and out of that, later on, um, trade unions were born out of this Gilda House in, in Germany. And this is basically also the idea of the company to connect creative talents and entrepreneurs in fashion with resources and expertise in order to grow business opportunities. And on the left-hand side, you can see some, some pictures from our 
last round table because you already said that networking is I think one of the most important thing when you start as a as a as a designer as a as an entrepreneur as a, as a fashion designer and we um, hold uh, regular round tables in order to discuss common uh, challenges and problems structural problems of uh, young fashion designers um, here in, in Ukraine in Kiev in order to find common sense to find best practices uh, support each other network with each other um, and this is a, a regular tool um, for mentoring for exchanging and we are offering as as a company to support really young young designers and apart from that um, we um, also invest um, so financially support um, existing high potential brands um, in order to expand their organization, their processes, to professionalize their processes in order to uh, scale their business also outside of the local market. Having that said, and enough about me, let's maybe um, continue um, what's important about you, because I think now it's, it's the time. Um, we have seen really that the, the fashion industry in the last couple of weeks and months is changing really drastically and that this industry is currently very highly competitive and just really structurally changing and um, already before COVID-19 but especially now after COVID-19 and the lockdown situations retailers are more and more under continuous pressure um, um, to, to diversify and to react to, to trends. And we've seen also a huge wave of, of consolidation, meaning that big brands um, um, went bankruptcy um, and uh, stepped out of the market um, because they were not flexible enough, they were not agile enough and, and also open-minded and creative enough to adapt to these um, changing market, market circumstances. And uh, these places are now free and give a lot of potential for smaller brands and, and new brands, new faces uh, in the industry. And it's not only the, the economic change and the change of the whole industry, which offers now the potential for, for new brands to step in and to be seen also internationally, um, it's also the fact that we are in the middle of a generation change or a generation shift, I would call it. Um, because the Gen Z and millennials, according to a Bloomberg analysis, um, make up all, over 50% of our world population by end of 2020. And their preferences and their needs and their mindsets um, will change our society but also our economy and our industries significantly and this will also um, shape and also influence the fashion industry and also the future um, way of, of shopping. Um, so let's have a look what needs and what preferences um, this, um, this generation has. So in the end, they are looking beyond um, tangible, tangible products um, and they want to know um, what impact the brand they are buying has on the society and also on themselves. And um, by that spread, prioritize brands whose mission and, and, and vision um, they share. And attributes like uh, local um, production, eco-friendly material, ethical practical practices, um, an inclusive uh, culture, uh, no animal testing for, for beauty, um, and just strong environmental um, perspective um, are the top attributes for this generation um, to take care of and to, to um, engage with a brand who, who uh, includes this in their vision. And when this Gen Z and millennials, so this generation, um, doing some fashion purchase. Their purchase decisions are mostly based on price, so they're very price sensitive, um, on design, so um, they have definitely a huge design approach, um, quality, sustainable manufacturing, and lastly, it's the brand name. So with this generation, we can see a huge um, shift 
to, to smaller brands, to less known brands, and long lasting brand engagement is less common for this kind of type of, of customers. And the last point I think is, is very beneficial and, and very important is they are looking for a unique item or unique items um, that set them apart and express their individuality. So the times of H&M, of Zara, where almost everyone was wearing the, the same clothes is a bit over with this generation. They're looking into more, more than a product and something more individual. And especially in Western European uh, markets, um, we cannot close our eyes um, for this generation because last week, just in Berlin, um, the, the um, Friday for Futures um, marches, so to say, just um, started again, um, led by Greta Thunberg. And uh, when she met last year with Barack Obama, she said, no one is too small to have an impact. And I think this is exactly the mindset and also the expectation this generation is openly sharing with the world, with the society, that impact is important for them. And what, what the world, the society, brands, industries have an impact on their future. And this is, I think, very important um, to understand. And this can be also proven um, by numbers because um, a, a latest research by McKinsey company just shared that younger consumers, younger consumer segments um, shifted stronger to smaller or less known fashion brands compared to 2019. So if we look into this, I hope you can see maybe my mouse, um, look into um, this chart. I mean, it's a bit overwhelming with numbers, but still, um, it shows um, the increased purchases from smaller or less known brands since 2019. And this you can, you can easily see from millennials and also Gen Z um, between 19 and 9% and also here for Gen Z more or less on the same level. They strongly agree and agree that they buy more from smaller or less known um, fashion brands with a concrete mission. And, oops, and in numbers and in revenue, it's expressed um, plus um, almost 40 and plus 50 percent for these two generations, an increase in revenue for smaller and less known brands. So that's why I say the time is now because you can feel it. There are so much changes and in the direction where it's very beneficial for new faces, new brands. Um, to, to um, gain reach and also to gain recognition on international markets. And I'm talking already about impact quite a lot. And um, I'm a very, I wouldn't say rationale, but a very number and analytical uh, driven person. So I try to, to express and explain impact in a very simple formula, I would say. So impact, is for me the result of innovation multiplied by reach. And uh, we can have now a look in a bit more detail what this exactly means. So what does innovation in the end mean? Um, innovation for me is far beyond product creativity and design. Because I was so lucky, um, Victoria shared with me a link where I can uh, already see uh, your collections, your videos, your photos, your mood boards, your sketches. So I was very, very impressed about the creativity and already also the innovation um, you, you um, presented. Um, so, but nevertheless, innovation in that sense to touch the future shoppers, it's about more than being innovative in terms of new color trend and new shapes and new drapings and new uh, materials. Um, I try to summarize this in five or try to cluster it in five different areas where innovation in combination with reach will create good impact, great impact also for smaller brands. So this is on the one hand side, of course, design and material revolution, because in the end, it's about the product. The second one, where innovation um, can be developed in your product are social trends. 
Third one is sustainability first, then we have operational excellence and digital escalation. So I tried to um, give you some food for thought on the next slides, what I mean um, with the, um, with the, um, sorry, now I lost my screen, with the uh, um, separate topics. So let's start with design and material revolution. Um, so in that case, um, we already heard a lot and that a lot is going on around fabrics, um, that we step away from artificial um, fabrics to smart fabrics. Here's a lot of innovation going on together with the automotive industry. Um, we have plant-based fabrics instead um, from oranges, from pineapples, uh, from mangoes. So there's really a lot of um, um, natural based um, fabrics up and coming. Um, but also upcycled material like plastic um, uh, from the ocean. Um, and these topics are already very, very ongoing. And it doesn't mean that you have to um, uh, introduce or invent new fabrics. No, it's about how you get inspired by these fabrics and implement this in your collection, which fits to your DNA of, of the brand. Um, but the second part is even more important and even more challenging. And um, this is um, the timeless and minimalistic design and especially multifunctional clothing. And um, I, when I looked through the different um, collections, I saw a very nice example from Massa from Slovenia. I do not know if she's here, but this is a very, very nice example how innovative, how multifunctional you can create a product design. Um, and this is, I think, the challenge and the, and the future direction in terms of design revolution, how you can innovate design um, on a long lasting um, idea. The second pillar is sustainability first. Um, I think the buzzword um, of the last two years in the fashion industry um, is definitely sustainability. Um, the number of sustainable fashion brands increased by almost 600% in the last two years. So since 2017, almost 600% increase of sustainable brands. And I personally also have the feeling that almost every brand calls itself a sustainable brand. And um, you can see here on the left hand side, there are many, many uh, ways how to have um, impact um, on a product to make it a sustainable product. So it can be either the, the fair and, and ethical treatment um, of the workers in the production facility you're using. It can be uh, upcycling. Um, but it can be also eco-friendly and a timeless design. So you see that also the first point is very interconnected and intertwined with the second one. But also um, business mm, constructions, businesses around closing uh, rental and secondhand vintage um, are definitely potential ways in order to innovate in terms of a sustainable um, product. But um, let me give you one recommendation also from my past at Zalando. I was, um, I was lucky to participate in a, in a big project in order to develop the sustainable strategy for Zalando until 2025. And um, it's very important that once you decide, and I read also um, a lot in the description of your vision um, or maybe about your about your collection I read that a lot of you guys already think of sustainable um, material are hoping for a sustainable um, future of the fashion industry um, but here it's very very important um, that in case you want to follow up in, in your in your brand DNA on that that you work long term with these kind of labels and, and certifications um, because it's important to, to diversify and also to distance you on the long run from brands which are just proclaiming, um, hey, I'm a sustainable brand, although they are not really sustainable because you will see that the, that the market uh, will be flooded 
um, by sustainable um, products in the next couple of years because more or less everyone is seeing the need for this topic to tackle in their businesses. I mean, Inditex Group is launching a bit um, ethical and an eco-friendly campaign, um, whereas you would say, hmm, maybe as a fast fashion, one of the biggest fast fashion retailer is already in itself a contradiction, but still they also want to jump on this train of sustainability. So that's why it's so important to long term think about how can I prove to my customer that I am a true sustainable brand. And another research found out that especially for this Gen Z customer, um, it's important to get a clear, so this is number three, point number three and point number four, a clear um, information um, via certificates or labels that this product was made in a sustainable manner and uh, a transparent brand communication on the benefits. And here we come back to the impact of buying um, this product is crucial and very, very important and would even incentivize um, this group of customer to buy even more. And also here, the first point, better design, style and range. You can see that this generation is really this, this future shoppers are um, want to look good, have a design approach, but also want to do good um, at the end of the day. And that the last point, which was still very popular, I guess, probably ever since, um, if celebrities, influencers, bloggers are promoting this sustainable um, approach, would not even convince them that much only with 13% to buy even more sustainable products. So it's really like an intrinsic um, wish um, to look good and to do good. Let's come to the third point. This is um, social trends. And here I chose uh, one big social trend, which will bring the, the biggest potential probably in the next couple of years in terms of reach and innovation because we are just at the beginning um, of the topic of inclusivity um, and I chose three big topics I would, I would say in this area and this is on the first hat um, gender inclusivity so everything what is around unisex and gender neutral fashion doubled in market share in this year versus 2019 so this topic is really booming and leaves a lot of range to make experiences, try to understand this topic and implement this in, in your collection. And here I also find a very, very nice um, example. I think this was from Victoria from Moldova. Um, I really personally like a lot already the, the mood board with this um, powerful, strong women tomboy um, and that um, this collection also shows that certain labels or colors of a collection shapes um, are not only reserved for a certain um, gender. And also referring back to our future shoppers, 38% of the Gen Z's and 27% of the millennials strongly agree that gender no longer defines a person as much as it used to. And you can see this um, also within celebrities, really um, uh, bloggers, um, they are also more gender floating in their relationships, how they interact, how they dress, how they cross dress. So this is a huge trend um, and would innovate definitely the industry um, in order to, to get closer and engage with our future shops. The second sub part, I would say, a subtopic of inclusivity is for me women empowerment. Um, so not, it started with hashtag me too movements in order to highlight the women's role in their society and their rights to say no. Um, and this topic was also tackled um, very intensively already by some big um, fashion brands like Dior or Chanel. Um, and it's, I would say it's even more prominent than ever because you would say, okay, this Me Too um, story is already a couple of years ago, um, but still also 
with the role of Greta Thunberg, for example, young women um, want to stay in the front and want to fight for their rights. In Germany, they are discussing heavily right now if they want to give quotas um, for um, advisory board seats that at least one or two seats must be filled by a woman. So this powerful, how to empower women is more present um, than ever. And I also chose a very nice example I liked um, from you guys. I think it's from Katarina, also from Ukraine um, and her collection. And for me, this quintessence, the summary, um, the woman transformation from a decorative passive object into an active acting subject. It's for me such a powerful, powerful sentence and really summarizes what this social trend is about. And I think he, she implemented this also very nicely and it's a good example how to, to implement these social trends in a collection in order to, to have a voice um, in fashion. And the third one is um, size um, inclusivity um, because the plus size fashion business increased also crazy in the last couple of years. We're always able to grow um, double digit and it's booming already in the UK, it's booming already in the US. Um, and also back in the days at Zalando, um, it was really um, even growing between two, three hundred, four hundred percent. So that a separate department was even established because there is so much um, potential because also the message in fashion with this body conscious and that style has no size in comparison with this women empowerment gives really a multiplicator uh, in potential. And it's also great to see like on, on the um, right, Versace last week um, was for the first time showing their collection um, with plus size models. So also the, the boundaries, which was not normal still um, to show your collection as a very luxury brand um, with plus size models and also the boundaries are also now um, um, falling, so to say, um, and, and this, this trend is definitely arriving and gives much more potential to also play with it in collections and make it like an innovation um, in, your, in your brand DNA. The fourth um, pillar in terms of innovation is probably the less um, interesting, <laughs> maybe the, the less sexiest, I would say. Um, it's operational excellence. Um, because I just explained at the beginning um, that many, many big brands also dropped out of the market, um, went bankruptcy. Um, because they were not flexible enough, they were not creative enough, they were not agile enough, open-minded enough. Um, and this is also not only on, on from design perspective, open-minded and creative and flexible enough, but also from their operational side. And um, here it's quite important to, to be open-minded and also innovative and creative when it comes to tools, to processes across um, the value chain and to be agile also in, in terms of, of your technology about your processes and your organization um, in order to be profitable because in the end um, it should be all about having a profitable business um, because I guess um, it's not only a hobby of you that you spend so much time and education and money and passion um, that you probably want to want to build up a future and a profession and the business um, which is profitable and which is also productive. Um, and that's why it's so important to be also innovative in operational excellence um, because we come later to, to the part in terms of reach and the digital escalation. In the end, the future will be digital. And um, it's important to start already very early um, in the beginning of your brand and of your company in a very um, 
structured and process driven way in order to be ready to start with certain digital platforms to be ready to start with certain working with with certain partners to be um, ready to mix up your supply chain and um, if a certain trend comes up so it's important to to think of these three this triangle of technology of course um, you don't have to buy um, a million dollar um, IT system, no. With technology is also meant, please do not do everything handwritten and manually. Yeah, rather start digital um, and, and in a more analytical and, and, and structured way. And also in the processes and organization, um, start to create from day one with clear processes and not that all of the sudden the customer comes, wants to buy, wants to start working, and you have to start everything from scratch every time this happens. So um, I know for creative people, this is at least my experience from the past, it's always a bit hard to really do these operational structured um, um, things, um, but it will help you long term to, to um, create really lasting reach and also recognition. Um, because what's important nowadays from a retailer and partner side that you're reliable, um, that you work structured, that partners and retailers don't spend and waste too much time in working, figuring out back and forth. Um, I think this is also due to the Corona situation, efficiency and productivity right from the beginning will give you a huge advantage to, to last long um, in a partnership as well. I did not forget about the digital escalation, um, but the digital escalation is also very much interconnected and intertwined um, with reach. But let me um, tell you one thing, um, or why um, impact can only be generated um, from the innovation part with the multiplicator reach, because um, you can be as innovative and creative um, as you want but if you don't have a proper reach if you don't connect and engage with your future customers and with the people you want your brand to to buy um, then probably no one will hear your innovation and your thoughts and that's why this factor reach um, is so important and um, Basically, this digital um, escalation explains the factor reach because what's, what we have seen in the last couple of months is that customers um, acting increasingly online probably also feel it, feel it from yourself. Um, fashion brands um, need to engage um, with, in an authentic way and with authentic messages uh, digitally. And also, if you if you see here, this graph also, again, a lot of numbers, um, but basically it shows the change in time spent on selected activities. Um, so especially like um, video content, social media, um, all of this increased by 50% only in the last six months. Yeah, um, and this shows already where the journey is, is moving um, because this whole situation kind of forced us and pushed us to. But this already shows us um, if we want to reach out, we need to do it in a digital way and most likely um, via social media and uh, video content. And if we also translate this now to sales, um, we see that the digital native, so we just talked about the Gen Z and millennials right at the beginning, compared to the silver surfer. So the silver surfer are the ones um, older than 50. We see a quite significant um, gap already between them because if we only look into the online purchases in 2019 worldwide, 50% of them were done by this generation, Gen Z and millennials. And we see that the silver surfers still stick to um, a more traditional way in terms of shopping and more to the traditional retail models, um, which still exists. 
But um, we have seen, I already touched it, um, the worldwide situation um, is really pushing us to changes. Um, and the COVID-19 um, um, situation um, worked as a fire accelerator for online um, business and um, stressed um, this topic of reach, how can you reach out to your customers, um, push this more and more into a digital direction. So Zara, for example, um, wants to close up to 1,200 um, stores and want to invest one billion of dollars in their digitalization and in their online um, shopping and online business. Um, same counts for H&M. They also speed up um, their store closures and want to heavily invest in online shopping. And we can also see that um, really mm, historical retailers, I would already say like Lehman Marcus or Bergdorf Goodman, which is really like a, like a heritage and one of the, one of the guiding lights of, of New York, um, also went bankruptcy. Uh, or at least uh, is, is struggling and trying to come back on their feet in order to, to get back to normal operation. And at the same time, uh, you can see, or you can, you can, yeah, in the press and in the media, uh, like Business of Fashion posted, I think two or three days ago, um, the hypothesis and question, um, if online marketplaces are the new department stores, and probably they are, probably they are, they are not tomorrow, but they will be in the very near future. And you can also see um, at Zalando, at that example, um, they had like a record Q2 result, um, of course, pushed by um, the corona um, situation. Um, and they could um, gain almost 5 million um, new active customers only in the second quarter of this year. And um, I called a couple of my old um, colleagues um, before today to find out how is the situation and also an absolute record um, second half of the year is expected um, because they see this dramatic um, shift from off to online. Um, in their numbers and many, many brands want to start working with them because they have the reach with the number of active customers. That's why let me maybe um, share their vision also. So when it comes um, at the Lando to reach, um, they are operating in 17 European countries. So let me give you a little example around um, Zalando. So 17 European um, countries um, they have 34 million active uh, customers um, in, until 2020. Um, they have more than 600,000 um, items on their website and on their platform um, from two, over 2,500 um, brands. And with that, they could generate um, 6.5 billion revenue in 2019. And uh, as I said, I, I called a couple of old colleagues um, and the expected growth in 2020 is between 20 and 25%. Um, whereas retailers across the globe, um, but mostly in, in Central Europe are expecting a loss and a decline between 20 and 25% um, versus the last year. And probably you are also asking yourself, okay, I'm, I'm still, um, at the beginning of my career, I'm a smaller brand, I'm a designer brand. Um, probably Zalando is not the right place, this big player to get in touch and to also promote my, my brand because it's more mainstream, it's more mass market and here the interests um, are not really overlapping. And um, two years ago I would say yes, um, but also Zalando is realizing that within um, the 34 million active customers and um, there are many many Gen Z's and Millennials and um, the good thing with these digital platforms is um, that um, they can gather many many data points and find out that this generation wants to be more individual, wants to 
more wants to have more local brands wants to have more local heroes like they call it um, wants to have more sustainable brands um, so this is very very transparent so that they just launched um, two or three months ago um, the designer section can you see my pointer here the designer section um, and within this um, designer section um, they um, it's it's possible within the designer section it's possible to also promote yourself as a smaller designer brand um, because they are aiming for working with smaller brands they are aiming for this individuality and that's why um, let me share with you a little film um, which tries to explain and express also um, how they see their future customer and from my point of view this goes very much in line with this design individual approach smaller brands local heroes can deliver so let's see if this works out with the movie please shout if you cannot see or hear it okay So, and I think this, this um, imagery also explains um, how diverse they see also the future um, in their customer group. So you could also see um, this creative um, design affine uh, people um, and tomboy um, aspect. So I think this, this shows also the potential for, for smaller brands and designer brands to get in touch with these digital platforms in order to promote and to also gain, gain the reach um, due to this big um, customer group and customer base. Um, but I mean, it sounds so easy, okay, then you start working with them. Um, let me also come back to the operational excellence um, because unfortunately this, this one, um, this picture is um, only written in German, but I can quickly explain. Um, I come back to the operational excellence um, because um, these platforms, these digital retail platforms are standardized machineries. I mean, there are millions of millions of items uh, coming in every day, has to be shooted, has to be put in the system and so on and so on. And there are various possibilities to show your product um, online so it can be either um, bought in the fashion store by Zalando, but what they also introduced um, now is to upload from your own web shop your product into their uh, into their fashion store. Um, but this dotted line, which looks so easy, is actually the operational excellence because everything happens with within a data exchange. So that's why it's so important to start really early to build up your company um, ready to expand also in a, in a digital way. Because also um, not only uploading your product, but also from a convenient um, convenience um, factor, 
like same day delivery to the customer, um, free and easy return, everything around the logistics and the delivery um, convenience is really, really important. And how to deliver your product into, into the warehouse of these digital platforms is also um, a very difficult scenario because like I said, um, 4,500 brands coming every day in order in order to deliver the product. So this operational excellence to build up future businesses is apart from an innovative, creative um, design mindset, really, really important to, to think of. And before I finish now my presentation, um, let me um, close with a quotation of uh, Mr. Karl Lagerfeld. Um, he once said, you don't have to do everything, but whatever you do, do it 100%. And what I mean with this um, quotation is um, that I showed you now or explained to you a huge variety um, of and possibilities um, to be innovative um, and, to, and to implement this in a collection in order to reach out to this huge future customer um, group of Gen Z and millennials. Um, but, I want, but I want to stress one more time is that it's important that you pick the pieces and interpret the, the stories um, which fits to your to your creative mindset, which fits to your to your brand DNA, which fits to a, your way of, of treating a product and treating a fabric. And it's important to to not look too much to the right and to the left. What is what is my competitor A B are doing? Um, try to find the way to yourself and this to keep this clarity of of your design and your 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 talent. Um, to the product. Um, but I think there is really much, much um, possibility nowadays to be innovative and to, to get reach. Um, it's getting actually easier because you see Gen Z and millennials are open-minded to try things out. Um, and it's actually easy on a digital way, easier, let's say, to reach out to, to consumers and to customers. And uh, I can only say um, that I was very impressed by the first things I saw from you guys. And I wish you really the best of luck in this contest and also um, the most success in order to create an impact um, in the future, how we would like to do it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sabrina. Um, so I saw that we already have one question. Um, yeah, um, so the question is, I don't know who is it from, but um, is, if there is a chance to survive virtual closing as a product? Sorry, can you repeat it? Oh, uh, you can see it in the, um, in the chat. Yeah, I saw already um, one in the chat. chat. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah. Yes and no, I would say. So um, yes, um, because the way the future is digital and I think um, to, to develop a more sustainable industry, um, there's a lot of virtual going on um, and it will be less personal probably also in the future. Um, but on the other hand, still um, consumers, customers looking for, for something tangible they, they need to try. So it's really a mix of, of, of going digital and virtual, but still at the same time um, having, uh, having a product um, you need to fall in love with. All right, I actually have a question for myself. Um, so, you know, like a bunch of small um, independent brands, they before, you know, going online, they want to have an actual physical store. Do you see, do you think there is a, like a point of it? Like, is it worth it or does you should go straight away like digital? 
Um, I personally see the bigger uh, advantage to invest your, your capital, which is especially when you're a small brand, very limited, um, into m more digital solutions. Um, because um, the current retail landscape is very fragmented um, because the A locations are completely out of space in terms of uh, renting, in terms of money, um, but also the frequency within the city, so people coming and strolling around, getting some inspiration, is declining year by year. And this has nothing to do with, with COVID. This was also already um, before. Um, when I was leading the, the retail business at Tom Taylor, this is already seven, eight years ago, we already had the issue that less people come to physical stores and try and test because online shopping um, makes the world so transparent and makes it so convenient um, that people rarely decide to, to look for a parking space and queue on the, on the cash desk. So the limited financial money you have, I would rather invest in a digital solution. This can be your own web shop, but this can be also in, in systems IT, which makes it possible to connect to, to digital retail platforms, which has already this base and reach. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, also, there is a question from uh, Fidan, if you can read it, if you can see it, yeah. Um, we have in Ukraine, we have La Moda, it's something like Zalando, someone is asking. Yeah, exactly. This is um, like, a, mm, this, is, this is the same um, holding, I would say. So there's Rocket Internet um, in Berlin. Also, they have a lot of ventures. Um, and uh, a venture from Zalando is La Moda. They are very um, active in the, in the Asian uh, market, um, but also then apparently here, Turkey, they're very, but it's very similar to, to Zalando. It's at least the same, the same uh, mother company, let's say. Yeah, and there is another one. Um, Do you think that with this digitalization, brick and mortar is going to get stronger as a symbol of luxury and special experience. Yes, I do think so. I think there's also, um, we have to make a differentiation between luxury, ultra luxury and, and uh, mass market, I would say. So if we uh, remember this um, preferences of Gen Z, they want to have more individual um approach um, they want to express themselves more individual and there was also a recent study and that they prefer luxury goods um, because they feel that this is something more individual and more personal and because it's just from price wise something special and also um, if you have been to one of these luxury stores the treatment um, in that store. So it's also very individual, very personal, um, like, uh, yeah, the, the sales assistants uh, spends a lot of time explaining you the product, spends a lot of time in treating you very well. Um, and this is a core advantage, which core advantage which is also very interesting for this new generation. So this brick and mortar for ultra luxury um, will probably stay um, not on the level like it is right now, but would probably stay. Um, on the flip side, everything what's mass market, um, what's high street, this, this top shops and, and Primark will probably decrease because it's, it's double negative, so to say, for this generation. It has no individual approach, um, no services, um, and it's also the complete contrast of sustainability. So there will be two streams and the luxury will be, I think, the, the bigger winner of it. I have a question. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the uh, first actually was the preferences of the generation of the uh, generation Z and millenniums. They're price conscious. At the same time, they like the design. So this, there is a dilemma. How would you combine a design? Because it's like, you know, like that's an investment with the price conscious of this generation, consciousness of this generation. Um, price consciousness in this context doesn't mean cheap. So they don't expect 
that a product which has a design approach and has this individual approach, what they are expecting, will cost the same as a H&M or Zara t-shirt. Um, they did a little experiment uh, last year where they said, okay, how much are you ready to pay up for a sustainable product, for example? Because for a sustainable product, you know, okay, uh, it has different fabrics. It is made not in Bangladesh. Uh, it's made locally with good payment security for the workers, ethical standard, and so on and so on. Um, and uh, this research found out that the Gen Z generation is, um, is ready to pay up, uh, up to 100% more than a comparable product. So it's, this price consciousness is always about the perspective and the comparison. Um, so compared to their, to their uh, expectations, and compared to what they see in this segment. Yeah? So it doesn't mean I want to have something designed, but only want to pay 20 euro. I think this awareness of expectation and this impact for the future is there. So um, it's always a comparison to, to the segment and, and they, are, they are shopping. And another question is about what you talked, yeah, like you're going for the real shopping, you can get the, the uh, outfit, you can try it because sometimes you see, you can see it nicely on the digital, it fits really good on the model. And then you're coming, you're trying it and it's like, it's not yours with the digital, uh, like, you know, like what is the percentage of exchange, for example, and it's also how to handle it because if I'm a designer, I'm sending the thing that could be returned and um, sometimes like, you know, like the person tried it, it already doesn't have that new feel. Any, like just give any advice on how to approach it. It would be really mm -hmm. nice. So at Zalando, um, the average return rate, um, how it was called, it was around um, between 50 and 60%. So um, almost half of everything which was ordered came also back. And this is, I think, also um, the problem of, of online and, and digital, um, that it might be controversial if you think of a sustainable manner, having, having less leftovers, having less old stock, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but I think here it's also important when you work with your own webshop um, to, to work with video content, to work with good descriptions, to show details on websites, so to make it as physical as possible um, and um, to, to try to reduce the return rate. Um, what is, of course, beneficial when working with digital platforms, as I said, they are really, this is like complete data house. Yeah. And um, so if you return um, a product, then you have to cross, okay, was too, too big, too small. Um, but you can also engage um, on the website. You can write like on Amazon comments, okay, this was too small, this was too big, um, this was not the right color. And with all these data points, they gather and give you as a brand. So at the end of the season, you have a, a, a briefing or debrief um, with the buying department and they say, okay, in general, um, your clothes are too big. In general, you have a problem with shaping. Um, so it's a mixture of gathering data points and then make it better. And on the other hand, if you work with your own web shop, try to explain, express, show as good as much as possible. All right, yeah, thank you. So um, there's the question from Ahmed, I believe it is. Um, and if the clients will reconcile in VR. Yes, definitely. Um, VR will be um, a huge area for, for yeah, future development. Um, you can see this already quite significantly also in automotive. Um, I see this also from my husband. Um, the future will be um, working with VR um, try to make it as tangible as, as possible. Um, because this is also a very good tool, of course, to avoid uh, returning um, the product. And there's a lot of technology also going on 
Um, I'm not an expert on VR, but I also know that like digital wardrobes, VR, uh, where you can see yourself as realistic as possible in the, in the clothes is uh, in preparation um, and really like these big Amazons, um, Zara's H&M working on this digital wardrobe to make VR as a, as a core part um, of their business because to avoid um, this return rate. Right? So this will be definitely once the technology is also as good for usage that is not only okay I have now VR and it looks nice, no, but that it gives you really features um, uh, that make you be more convinced um, of the product, realistically convinced of the product. Um, I think this will be definitely part of the future. All right, thank you. And I believe the last question, um, what would be your advice regarding the strategy to going global when uh, you're from a country which is quite isolated from a global fashion industry? So outsource marketing services, platforms, funds, I mean, um, it's basically everything already answered. Um, I think this is uh, really something, if you are a country isolated, um, I wouldn't even say isolated, it's already enough that you are not part of the EU and this you can also see in, in Ukraine. It's quite difficult with, uh, with customs and everything to handle uh, on your own when you have to ship each and every parcel um, to the customer. So it's definitely uh, worth to explore um, partners which do the fulfillment for your products. So um, for example, also Zalando is doing this, you ship once all of your clothes to the warehouse of Zalando and they are taking care of the fulfillment. So they are accepting the orders, they, they are pre preparing everything, they are sending it to the customer. Once they are returns, they also take care of this. They have different channels to also uh, distribute the returns so that nothing has to come back to your country, for example, Ukraine. Um, advantage of uh, the revenue you are doing via um, that platform. But um, if you calculate this business case, I once also did it with one of my customers, it's definitely more easy to give everything to them instead of handling everything on your own, on an individual base, um, to find out, ooh, okay, what is the customs regulation in Switzerland? What is the custom regulation in Spain? Um, so I think it's definitely a challenge, but nowadays there are many, many fulfillment services, warehouses also located in Poland, for example, which is like very close to, to the regions where you as brands are, are operating and located. Um, and from that point, they will distribute um, in, in, in Europe or in other countries. Um, so this is definitely uh, a good possibility because there are many, many fulfillment um, companies which offer the services or even platforms already fashion platforms. Thank you so much and um, have a nice evening. Thank you also very much. And again, good luck for all the contestants and for the future and yeah maybe we see us somewhere uh, all your brands somewhere in the world so um yeah take care good luck and stay healthy